Okay, hello everybody. I'm Alan, and I'm happy to take you through a learning journey about human-robot interaction, or HRI, as we call it. What is HRI, and why does it matter? We see more and more robots around us in our everyday life. We see vacuum cleaning robots, we see cooking robots, we see service delivery robots, and soon we'll have driverless cars. While robotics is about improving the performance of a robot, HRI is about understanding how robots should behave in an environment filled with humans. And this addresses topics like, I'm a pedestrian and a driverless car comes. How do I know that it detects me and that I can cross the street safely? Or I need to cross path with a robot in a corridor. The fastest way for a robot to do that is to move full speed and avoid me at last minute. But the human would anticipate this and start moving on this left three or four meters away so that I can know and I can start moving on the left. That is what's most natural for me. And what is most natural for me is what I will do when I'm under stress or in a hurry. And that's why robots have to adapt to humans and not the reverse way. All this works very well and sounds very easy. And in movies, it works always perfectly, right? In real life, it's super, super hard. So let me take you through this. Because HRI involves many various disciplines. And that's what's fascinating. The human needs to understand the robot. And that involves great design. But the robot also has to understand the human. And that involves technical stuff like sensors, um, audio, video processing, machine learning. And the two of them need to collaborate seamlessly together. And that brings us into sociology and psychology. So let me introduce you to my friend Nao. Uh, Nao is a robot uh, that we use for education, research, and healthcare. And we, yeah, Nao will help us take through this journey of understanding what HRI is about. Hi there, beautiful people. I can't wait to share our adventures and show how robots like me can add a sprinkle of joy and be useful to your lives. So, Nao was born 18 years ago. He looks young, but he's already a major guy. He was designed and created by Adebaran, a French company founded by Bruno Maisonnier, and Nao started becoming popular when he was selected as a standard platform for playing soccer at the RoboCup. I'm actually also popular outside the soccer field. People love to come up and talk to me. And in those 18 years with now, we've learned a lot about uh, robot behaviors and human behaviors and how they react to each other. And there's still a lot to learn about how to create interactions that are intuitive, that are natural, so, and, 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 and all these learnings, they don't apply just to human-like robots. But what's good with a human robot is that it forces us, it gives the potential, and it forces us to think about how should a robot behave to trigger a natural reaction with a human. And that's, as I said, is very key in the attraction. So let's embark on this journey together with now. Time to start our story. Time to start our story. Okay. One first concept explaining Nao's popularity uh, can be related to the uncanny valley. Let me show, step aside and show this to you. Uh, this concept was coined by a robotist, a Japanese robotist named Masahiro Mori in 1970. Um, and the idea is that you feel more more comfortable uh, when the robot looks more human-like, okay, like a cartoon character or now. But at some point, when you start being too close to a human, then you start having a creepy feeling, and you drop into the bottom of this uncanny valley. And then you step out of that when the resemblance becomes perfect. And why is that happening? It's because millions of years of evolution have trained the human brains to be super good at detecting other humans. Right? So when we're seeing this, one part of our brain feels, hey, this must be a human. But deep down, 
we feel, no, it's not one. And this cognitive dissonance is what's creating the creepy feeling for us. That's right. But it's not just about how I look. It's also about how I talk and move in general. I don't try to act exactly like humans, just to act in ways they understand. Yes. So it's not exactly, it's not about just replicating how humans are operating. It's about creating a new way for mutual understanding between robots and humans. And this applies to the design of all social robots. In, in all social interactions of a robot, we need to think about uh, what can be used to create that engaging uh, moment so that people can proactively <coughs> want to uh, start a conversation or an interaction with a robot. And it's fascinating. <laughs> you know, despite the initial hesitation, once people see us, really see us, they start to open up. They share stories, laughter, and sometimes even their dreams. And that's what I like about that sort of robot HRI, is the robot is not just about performing a task. You can start bringing an interaction at a intuitive, uh, how should I say that, uh, emotional level somehow. And you can start leveraging some emotional value into the job you're assigning to a robot. So for instance, in classrooms, uh, we see now demonstra demonstrating a unique ability to attract attention and the focus. And then the children working with now, they learn playfully. Uh, children speak up more to now than to the teachers. Why? Because now can repeat endlessly, and it never judges you. So in that situation, in the classroom, and time flies by. And you know, uh, I feel sometimes like a robot when I don't have emotions. And the funny thing is this robot can arouse emotion and help me think more human. Okay, let's talk about perception. How does a robot perceive the environment? Well, the design is the icebreaker about the interaction. The perception is the foundation of how the robot can understand the world and start navigating and, and acting into it. So we as humans, uh, we are always immersed in the world. We believe we experience the world directly. Actually, our senses capture an incredible amount of data all the time, but it's sent to our brain. And our brain filters those data and processes it through our beliefs and mental models. It's the same for a robot. Uh, the robot captures data from the world through various sensors. It can be microphone, cameras, but also sonars, lasers, thermometers, right? And all those data are sent to the CPU, which then processes it uh, via various algorithm, AI, uh, and, and that start, that's how they start making sense of the world. Oh. I see 307,000 to 100 pixels. And this tells me that 12.4% of the audience is not asleep yet. Alan. Hmm. So, now you've been through an incredible path of developing that perception. Tell us more about what you went through. Well, for years it was so hard for me to track a ball and not score against my own field. But later I learned to detect people's faces, then all kinds of objects. The things that come naturally to you are the hardest for me. I improve as I get better sensors and richer algorithms. It took me to read 1,000 to 100 images of four people's hands to recognize 300 hand gestures. That's very impressive now. And can you tell us, looking forward, what's, com what's coming ahead? What's in the future? The horizon glows with promise. Alan, I can understand this world better and better. I can now distinguish you from a cucumber most of the time. And that's why I'm not dressing in green. Though I don't see like you, I can understand the world in my own way. This allows me to give feedback to rehab patients, making me Europe's first social robot certified as a medical device. 
So that's a very interesting example of HI applied to resolving real world problem. This started as a research project and now it's a solution for rehab centers uh, for patients with neurological challenges. Uh, patients, especially children patients, engage more willingly when they're stimulated by now. They put more efforts in trying to do the exercise that is requested from them. And in the meantime, for the therapist, instead of doing those moves, the therapist can step aside and take the time to look at what's going on, to observe how it's improving, and, and, and to uh, provide advices to uh, the position or, or, or correct uh, what is not doing, done well. Okay, now with your improved sense of vision, can you go as far as telling us what comes in the future and what we're going to talk about in the next slide? Yes, let's dig further into the topic of interaction, conversation. Conversation. So we all know that uh, a good conversation is like a dance. It's about the art of mastering the unspoken rules of when to pose and when to step in. And that's no easy feat. See, not so easy. <laughs> but conversation is also about the contents. What are we talking about? Now, are you able to hold a proper conversation now? From my soccer playing days, I've really broadened my horizons. Now, I can talk in many languages, and recently, I can use GPT-3 and GPT-4 to understand anything. So, you're powered by a large language model? Not quite. Mm, really? We went through my script just yesterday, remember? Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So, coming back to conversation. Uh, another important part to master are the so subtle social cues, things like body language and tone. These are very important uh, to create a very natural conversation. Otherwise, I might sound too robotic. If you understood more the context now, could you become less robotics? So for instance, let's imagine you're in a library. I'd be all whispers and quiet curiosity, making sure I'm just as serene as the pages of an old book. Okay, and now, if you're in a party, would you be able to bring fun? Oh, I'd be the life of the party, telling jokes, playing games, and maybe even leading a robot to dance off. Yeah. So, you see, it's all about adapting to the circumstances being able to say and do the right thing at the right time in the right place. And this is key for us uh, to develop the interaction in a way that is valuable and intuitive uh, for humans. With a little help from my IoT friends, I can make anywhere feel just right. Yeah! Oh yeah, IoT is how you may be able to extend your capabilities and grasp and action the environment even better. Would you like to invite them to your ne ne next TED Talk now? Sure, if I am invited again as a TED Talk speaker. Okay, we talked a lot about technological challenges, but let's remind of users. Robots have a promise to relieve humans from tiring tasks, from repetitive tasks, to take away things that create uh, troubles and pains for us, right? Um, but that promise is limited as long as you need an engineer to set up the robot. You need an engineer around you to operate the robot. So making it simple and natural is very key to make it accessible to everybody. And that sh should be the promise of robots. Exactly, Alan. I should be the one adapting to you, not the other way around. Okay. From technological side, we're about, we're close and about and progressing to manage most challenges. 
robots become better and better at navigating in an unstructured environment, like a home. Uh, they become better and better at grasping objects. And machine learning is helping them to recognize objects around them so we can make sense of what is happening. And the natural language interaction is coming up more and more, right? The big next challenge that we see may be more a philosophical question. How autonomous do I want the robot to be? And we at United Robotics Group have a clear position about that. We feel that the robot should not try to become its own autonomous thing, right? It should be a tool, something that serves a human. We define a job for them. The human should always be in a driver's seat. It should control. It's fine and it's great if the robot is autonomous and keeps developing on its own and learns within the job that we assign to them. But I don't want the robot to overstep the job because then I would feel in danger. Okay? Uh, having the robot kept and developed and, and action within their job is key to giving me the trust I need uh, to have that robot operating every day next to me and supporting me. So, we've been through a long journey uh, about HRI. We're seeing promises in the future. Um, and thank you very much now uh, for taking us through this path. And, and we want to continue a long way with you. And thank you, everybody, uh, for listening and helping us to dream this future. Mm -hmm.